Are you ready to make the most of your oil and gas mineral rights? Welcome to the Mineral Rights Podcast. Get the knowledge and resources you need to manage your minerals and royalties. Here is your host, Matt Sands. Welcome to the Mineral Rights Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Sands, and I'm here to help you make the most of your mineral rights and royalties. Justin Williams joins me again to provide the individual mineral owner perspective. Hey, Justin. Hi, Matt. Thanks for having me as always. Thanks as always for being on the show. And today we're going to talk about the Powder River Basin in Wyoming and parts of Montana and give you an overview about the things you need to know if you have minerals or royalties in uh, these areas. So definitely listen to the end. We have some exciting news coming out of the area, some impressive well results that we'll outline. And as always, please let us know if this is useful. And if you have any requests on a topic that you'd like us to cover or another producing uh, basin or play that you would like us to cover in a future episode. And the best way to do this actually is just to go ahead and leave that in the review on iTunes. And we'll give you a shout out on a future episode and take your suggestion to heart. So speaking of that, Justin, we're falling behind on recognizing some of our uh, reviews. How about we give out a a shout out for one of the reviews that was left uh, recently? I think that sounds great to me. So we've got a review from Bell Cougarita, and it says, if you're on either side of the mineral rights coin, then you can't afford not to listen. I was able to get pertinent information on mineral rights and apply it to my specific situation. What's great about the MRP is that it offers the fundamentals of mineral rights with its many facets. With each episode, the listener graduates into the realm of understanding their mineral rights, both from the perspective of a landowner and also as a potential mineral right investor. By listening to this podcast, I'm expanding my knowledge base. I'm gaining confidence in my ability to make decisions with my mineral rights. The podcast has no doubt saved me money and helped me to to arrive at decisions that will benefit myself and potentially my legacy. Many, many thanks to the producers of the Mineral Rights Podcast. We didn't know we needed you. What a wonderful review. Great review. Uh, Thank you so much, Bell Cougarita, wherever you are. So let's go ahead and dive into our overview of the Powder River Basin. All right. Sounds good. The Powder River Basin is located in southeast Montana and northeast Wyoming. It's about 120 miles east to west and 200 miles north to south. A fun fact, the Powder River Basin is originally known for its coal deposits. In fact, the basin supplies about 40% of the coal in the U.S., according to the U.S. Energy Information Administration. In fact, it has become the single largest source of coal mined in the U.S. and one of the largest coal deposits in the world. Since most of the coal is Powder River Basin, is on federal lands, we're not going to talk about it in detail. Instead, we'll focus on the oil and gas deposits today. In fact, it was one of the largest sources of natural gas in the U.S. back around 10 years ago. Most of the gas came from coal bed methane. The name comes from the fact that the area is drained by the Powder River, amongst others, and generally speaking, it is pretty sparsely populated. The major towns in the Powder River include Gillette, population around 32,000, Sheridan, Wyoming, population about 18,000, and Miles City, Montana, population about 8,400. Counties that are part of the Powder River Basin include Campbell, Converse, Johnson, Natrona, Weston, and Niobera counties in Wyoming, and Bighorn and Powder River counties in Montana. And Matt, would you like to take a deep dive on the uh, geology here? Yeah, so the geology in the Powder River Basin is pretty exciting. And like the DJ Basin and the Permian that we covered in previous episodes. What makes the Powder River so exciting is the fact that it has stacked oil and gas plays coming from multiple formations. So generally speaking, oil and gas is produced from rock that ranges in age from around 300 million years ago to 60 million years ago, or even more recent than that. And most of that production comes from what they call the Cretaceous period, which was around 145 to 66 million years ago. And then we're going to talk really in depth about that Cretaceous period and some of the different uh, petroleum systems that are within that. And it's generally broken down between what they call the upper Cretaceous and lower Cretaceous. So talking about the upper Cretaceous, we have the Nibrera total production system, and then Maori shale forms the lower Cretaceous. The upper Cretaceous has been a target for exploration since the 1950s when the Dead Horse Creek field was discovered. And more recently, there were several discoveries in the 1970s 
that were made whereby um, stratigraphic traps were identified as part of an important target in order to ensure success of any conventional exploration well. So what that's saying in kind of a nutshell is basically they're looking for a trap where oil and gas would have accumulated. And uh, using seismic data, they would look for where they believe those traps to be and drill the wells where they've identified potential reservoirs. So again, that was sort of the MO for oil and gas industry back throughout kind of the beginning up until just recently with the uh, advent of horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing and some of these unconventional plays. Anyway, within the Nibrera total production system, uh, there are several formations to note, and you probably have heard of some of these, you know, reading investor presentations from some of the major operators in the basin, or just uh, and hearing it about it from other basins where some of these formations also exist. So from top to bottom, some of the formations of note include the Mesa Verde and Lewis sandstones, the uh, Parkman sandstone is part of the Mesa Verde formation, uh, primarily in the west side of the Powder River Basin. And uh, that particular target is is also one that they're looking at. You'll see that uh, listed as a target in some of the well permits out there. Uh, you have the Sussex and Shannon sandstones. And then you have the Nibrera formation, uh, which actually has believed to have been the source rock for those first two conventional targets uh, that I mentioned. So what that means is basically that's where the oil and gas was created, and then it migrated up through fractures and through porosity within the rock, and then was trapped at some spot that basically would uh, capture that and allow it to accumulate into enough of a volume so that you have what you consider an oil and gas reservoir. And then Finally, below that, we have the the Turner and Frontier sandstones. And what I'll talk about next, again, is the lower Cretaceous, where we had that Maori total production system. And it breaks down, again, top to bottom into the lower Cretaceous Fall River Lakota sandstone, which are conventional reservoirs, lower Cretaceous muddy sandstone, uh, another conventional reservoir, which was where a lot of oil and gas production came from historically. And in fact, the muddy was first drilled in the late 1800s in Fiddler's Creek and the Claritin fields on the east side of the basin. So producing from the the muddy sandstone for over 100 years. And then we talk about source rock again. The Maori shale is believed to have been the main source rock for the lower Cretaceous reservoirs in the basin. So all of this, if you talk from the top of the Parkman, all the way down past the Muddy to the Dakota, there's about 4,800 feet of stacked pay, which is huge. Uh, so you're thinking about you know, the depth of all of these stacked on top of each other. It's like a mile deep. And of course, it depends greatly on what part of the basin you're at. Some of these formations exist in some part of the basin and not parts of the others. But just in general, this just goes to show you how many targets and opportunities that operators are are going after in the Powder River Basin. So talked about this in the DJ Basin, you have the Nibrera and then the Codell. In the Permian Basin, you have, you know, again, multiple stacked formations, Wolf Camp and various others that are out there that are, again, what operators are are targeting and, and having great success with. So like I alluded to earlier, most of the historical production came from oil and gas wells that were drilled into some sort of a trap or seal. And they um, would call these conventional oil and gas wells. And usually when you're doing exploration in a conventional play, there's a pretty low success rate. So think on the order of only uh, one out of three wells uh, that would be successful with conventional oil and gas exploration. And so when we talk about the Minnelusa, we talk about the muddy you know, so those are the, some conventional targets within the Powder River Basin that you know, they're really looking at the geology, looking for a trap and looking for the presence of oil and gas using seismic data. And one of the things that we're looking at now is what was historically considered the source rock is being targeted with horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing. So that's, again, what you would have as being called the more unconventional plays. So those are the shales and tight sands like the Nibrera Formation and the Maori. And pretty much all the formations that I mentioned are currently targets of horizontal drilling, uh, especially across the southern part of the Powder River Basin. And that's where most of the activity is going on right now. Uh, Northern part is not so much. That's more, you know, still 
the conventional plays, even though they are doing some directional wells, some horizontal wells into those conventional reservoirs. But the geology, there's a level of geologic risk associated with uh, all of this in the Powder River Basin. We'll talk a lot more about that later in this episode. But in general, the unconventional plays are usually lower geologic risk than the conventional. So again, it just really greatly depends on how much we know about the play and the geologic attributes that really will dictate whether or not a well will be successful or more importantly, whether whether or not it's um, economic. So even though maybe the Nibrera formation is in a good part of the Powder River Basin, maybe there's a certain part of that that is really only going to be economic at today's prices. And so uh, that's something that operators are taking into account and learning more every day about. Justin, you want to talk a little bit more about why the Powder River Basin is a relatively uh, hot area right now? Absolutely. And like we mentioned in our episode about the DJ Basin and Permian Basin, a lot of it's because of the combination of the use of horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing to open up these rocks and allow that oil and gas to be produced from what has historically been considered a seal. They're also drilling down to the target formation, which generally is over a mile deep, and then go horizontal for one or two miles. And of course, that increases the chances of hitting a little reservoir and being able to produce. Then they fracture the rock using water at high pressure along with sand to keep the fractures open, allowing all that oil to, to pull it, for them to pull it from the rock and get it from those non-porous surfaces. Like mentioned, these two technologies have been around for a long time. Yeah. So Justin, um, those technologies have been around for a long time. And another piece of trivia I just want to throw out there uh, for a contest. And we mentioned this in the DJ Basin episode, which is episode 28. So if you haven't listened to that one yet, please go back and listen to it. And so the piece of trivia that we're looking for an answer to is what year was the first frack performed? And I'll give you a hint. It was in Kansas. After listening to that episode, if you know the answer, email me at feedback at mineralrightspodcast.com. I'll pick one of the emails received. Uh, let's see, it's October 1st when we're recording this. Anything received in the month of October, email it to me with your answer. I will pick one of the emails with a, with one of the correct answers uh, to get a free mineral rights consultation for whatever help you need for evaluation, help with reviewing a lease, anything like that, up, up to three hours of my time. So, Justin, I'll hand it back to you. And you want to talk about some of the major operators in the basin? Will do. And uh, just a note, that's a great opportunity for anybody who needs some extra help or is just curious about what to do in their situation. So some of the major operators right now in the Powder River Basin, Anschwitz, uh, which the privately held has the largest position at around 460,000 acres, and Adarco, who is now Oxy, has around 445,000 acres. Um, and with Oxy's recent acquisition of Anadarko, there's some speculation that there is a good chance that their position in the Powder River um, could be sold to help pay for the acquisition of Anadarko, which was a huge, huge price tag. Um, the big issue right now is that publicly traded oil and gas operators across the board are having a hard time getting support for any acquisitions not part of the Permian Basin. Plus, one of the downsides with the Powder River is it is still relatively early days in terms of proving to investors that wells can be drilled economically there. Some really promising results, uh, but we'll have to wait and see if they can get the uh, cost for drilling those wells down. Uh, EOG has around 400,000 acres, Devon Energy with around 330,000 acres, and Chesapeake with around 213,000 acres. Here are a few highlights from a couple of these operators, um, and it shows that they are bullish on the potential of the Powder River Basin. So Chesapeake Q2 of 2019, uh, this is from their investor presentation, has around 213,000 net acres, uh, like we mentioned. They expect to drill and complete, bring online 68 wells in 2019. They are currently running five rigs and two frack crews, and they are planning to spend around $500 million this year in that area. Good results in the Turner Formation. Reported single well production record RRC5, as well as greater than uh, 4,000 barrels of oil a day equivalent, including gas, and 3,000 barrels of oil a day. That well has around 160,000 barrels of oil cumulative production in the first four months, which is really good. They have two wells that they've reported, which have come in significantly higher than the rest of the uh, Chesapeake Turner wells. It's so hard to say if these are outliers or if they are onto something with a, a new completion technique there. Uh, EOG Resources, according to a map in their latest investor presentation, they consider the core area basically the eastern part of Johnson County, the southwest part of Campbell County, and the north part of Converse County. 
In an investor call at the beginning of 2019, they indicated that in 2018, we added more than 1,500 premium net drilling locations and nearly 2 billion barrels of oil equivalent of net resource potential uh, through the addition of the Maori and Nibera shell plays and new locations identified in the Turner sand, um, said Billy Helms, chief operating officer for AOG. In their second quarter investor presentation from August of 2019, this is up to 1630 net undrilled premium locations with 875 in the Maori, 555 in the Nibera, and 200 in the Turner. EOG defines premium locations as a minimum of 30% direct after tax rate of return with a flat $40 oil and $2.50 natural gas price. An interesting table from EOG included in their investment presentation shows how their acreage and the powder stacks up against their other premium plays, which include the Ingleford, the Bakken, the Wyoming DJ Basin, and Woodford Oil Window, which is in Oklahoma, and the Maori Nobrero wells have the highest reserves. So estimated ultimate recovery of 1,700 MBOE gross from the Maori, 1,400 MBOE gross from the Nibera, but also the highest total well cost of around 6 million normalized. Compare this to the Wyoming DJ Basin wells, where they have a total cost uh, target of about 4 million per well, but also around half the EUR per well, which is 695 MBOE gross. That's a mouthful of uh, abbreviations there, Matt. Yeah, it is. <laughs> that is a lot of uh, acronyms. So apologize. So yeah, MBOE for anyone, if they are not in the industry, that's thousands of barrels of oil equivalent. So if you think about it, it's like 1.7 million barrels of oil equivalent per well. So it's it's pretty massive when you think about it in those terms. Really, really promising stuff there. And, you know, really it's interesting thing across all those operators that you mentioned, Justin, there's around 21 rigs running in the powder as of September 13th, 2019, uh, according to shaleexperts.com. So it's, it's on the internet, you take it with a grain of salt, but, you know, a good number of rigs, but really when you compare that to the Permian, it's nowhere in even near that. So that's part of why the Powder River doesn't get a lot of press and why some of the um, operators are potentially faced with some resistance from investors when it comes to investing more in this area since it doesn't start with the name Permian and end with the basin. So that is uh, one thing to, to keep in mind. Now let's talk about some of the risks associated with oil and gas activity continuing to grow and expand. So if you have minerals in the Powder River Basin, I'm sure the big question is, you know, what what is uh, the activity level going to do over the next couple of years? Are there going to be more rigs moving in to the basin? And, you know, what I'll say, first of all, you have a couple of things to think about. First is economic risk. And basically what that means is commodity prices. And so Wells that are currently economic to drill at uh, an oil price of around $50 to $55 per barrel or around um, $2.50 for natural gas would likely not be economic if the prices drop significantly. So what that would cause is a slowdown in activity or stoppage uh, even in drilling new wells. And so they would move those rigs to other areas that, that are economic at lower prices in, you know, if that should happen. Now, hopefully that won't. And there's certainly a lot of um, geopolitical stuff going on right now and the end of 2019 that I think are going to help prop up the, the price of oil, but, you know, we'll just have to wait and see. So again, talk about this and we talked about it with the DJ and with the Permian. It's really part and parcel of doing business in the oil and gas industry. And the Powder River Basin is no, no different. We'll talk about geologic risk here in a minute again, but I'll t I put the economic risk higher in the Powder River Basin due to a few factors that we'll touch on in a minute. But before that, Justin, do you want to talk a little bit about sort of the local um, political environment and the political risk there? Absolutely. And, you know, my sense is that it's pretty low, being that the basin includes Wyoming and Montana, which have historically been pretty favorable to oil and gas development. A lot of tax revenue is generated from the industry in these states. Uh, plus, when you consider it as the least populous state in the U.S., there aren't many conflicts between oil and gas and residential development like you have here in Colorado and then also in some parts of West Texas. Talking specifically about Wyoming, since it makes up most of the Powder River Basin, when you think about the major industries, extractive industries, mining and oil and gas, are one of the biggest. According to the 2005 analysis by Boston College, 25% of Wyoming's GDP 
comes from extractive industries. Since Wyoming doesn't have income tax, so relies on severance and property tax, mineral extraction accounts for most of the property taxes paid in the state. Uh, then you have tourism. Wyoming has Grand Teton National Park, Yellowstone, Jackson Hole, around $2 billion a year in revenue, and that's 12% of the Wyoming workforce. Agriculture has been a big part of the economy in Wyoming. In fact, uh, Matt's great-grandfather homesteaded a ranch in Carbon County, Wyoming in the early 1900s. Uh, you know, it's not called the Cowboy State for no reason. So when you compare it to its neighbor to the south, Colorado, Wyoming is pretty favorable to oil and gas. Um, so I would categorize the political risk as being relatively low. In fact, an interesting tidbit in EOG's later investment presentation, they highlighted the fact that 100% of their activity is in the DJ Basin uh, in Wyoming, not in Colorado. Yeah, I, I would agree with that assessment. And that, I thought that was really interesting as well, that um, they were very clear that they um, have that acreage in, in Wyoming. And so I think what they're basically highlighting there is there's lower political risk. Obviously, if that acreage were in Colorado with everything going on, like we've talked about with uh, SB 19181 that was passed earlier this year, that's changing the way that oil and gas is regulated in Colorado. There's a lot of uncertainty there. But Wyoming, you know, it's like Justin mentioned, it's favorable environment. They, they want the operators there to develop the resources. Mostly the, the mineral owners are there, or the ranchers and the, and the folks that are um, living in those communities. And, and they're seeing a big economic boost, both at the state level that, you know, helps fund things like education. And then not to mention the, the royalties that the uh, landowners will receive. So... The next thing I want to talk about, though, is the infrastructure. And so we talk about infrastructure, think of things like pipelines, gas takeaway capacity, refining, and things like that. And one thing to keep in mind is that existing pipelines in the Powder River Basin are nearing capacity if they aren't there already. There are also several new pipelines that are being built or you know that may be uh, ready to come online soon. So that'll help alleviate some of those capacity issues. And good thing here, I'll say, is there are a lot of existing pipelines in the basin. Like we mentioned, this was one of the biggest um, gas producing regions in the U.S. before the big uh, shale revolution occurred. And so the, the real issue is, you know, how close are the existing pipelines going to be to where new drilling is going to take place? And so what it will probably require is some investment in connecting pipelines from those new wells that are drilled into existing infrastructure and existing um, takeaway capacity. And one of the things that is being done, so we talk about, you know, those old gas pipelines. There's an existing gas pipeline that runs down from North Dakota through the Powder River Basin and onto the Midwest. And what I read is that they're looking at potentially converting it to an oil pipeline to take all this oil that is now being discovered in the Powder River to the Midwest and to into refineries out that way. Um, so that's one potential thing that may happen. The other thing too that you have to keep in mind is, you know, as those new wells are being drilled, we have these initial production records that are continually being set as they're discovering the best way to complete the wells and to get the most out of them. And that example that Justin mentioned that um, Chesapeake gave for the RRC5 well, uh, which started producing at 3,000 barrels of oil per day. And if you think about that, if a company drills several successful wells on a pad, and it doesn't take long for that to um, to add up quite quickly and for any, you know, limited pipeline capacity that they might have to be filled up. And, you know, the good news from a capacity standpoint is most of those wells are pretty steep decline rate. So it really just depends on the timing of it as they are drilling these wells and bringing them online, if they can sort of phase them, they can um, do it in a in a manner that they can use existing, you know, maximize existing um, takeaway capacity and uh, not get into like an oversupply situation where they where they can't produce because they don't have anywhere to, to take the oil, as an example. And a couple issues with transporting oil, specifically in the Powder River Basin. First one is, like I mentioned earlier, is getting the oil from the wellhead um, to the nearest market. In this case, it's uh, Guernsey, and then transporting it from there. Another project that I um, read about was actually to take it from Guernsey down to the Gulf Coast and th to the refineries that are there. And so that's one big project. And then that other one that they're looking at converting that gas pipeline into oil service. And so good thing, like I mentioned, there's, there's, there is existing infrastructure there. It's not a new 
oil and gas, you know, field. And so what they're looking at is just really trying to make sure that they're having capacity for taking the oil away. And then on the flip side of that too, you also need to have somewhere to take the gas so that they don't have to flare it, which is, which is obviously undesirable from an environmental standpoint, as well as economic standpoint. And so they'll need to have some level of gas takeaway capacity so that they can produce the oil, mostly oil is what's being, um, being sought after right now. So that's the the big uh, issue. And kind of what I see here is that what will likely happen in the Powder River Basin, assuming it continues to progress and successful wells are continually drilled so that as the, the play is delineated and well understood, then there'll be more investment into infrastructure that will help you know alleviate this. But reason, the reason that it maybe is lagging right now is because we're still in exploration mode in the uh, Powder River Basin. And so the speed of development is a little bit dictated by the speed of the pipeline takeaway capacity that's being installed. But assuming they still have good well results and that continues, then I see there being a lot of investment in that pipeline's coming into the area because they'll have de-risked it enough for uh, midstream companies to come in and invest. So that's a little bit about the infrastructure. And then I'll uh, just kind of end on one final note around the geologic risk. So what does geologic risk mean? It really is referring to the possibility that you're not going to get oil or gas when you drill a well or not get as much as you expect. Again, this, this can vary greatly depending on the things that I mentioned earlier. If you're going to be in the hot area where they maybe have more data, maybe there's lower geologic risk there versus a conventional play somewhere else in the basin. So again, it, it really just depends on where you're at and what target you're going after. But I will say in general that right now I would classify the Powder River Basin as having higher geologic risk than, say, the geology of the Nibrera and the Codell that is fairly well understood, at least in the Colorado side of the DJ Basin. So while you think about political risk being higher in Colorado and the DJ Basin, the, I would say the geologic risk is lower there because we have a lot more data points to go by. The geology is a lot better understood, and so it's just a more mature oil and gas play. Again, it's still what we would call early days for the powder. Companies are still figuring out things and testing things like what is the optimal well design, you know, how certain parts of the geology are going to affect well productivity in one area versus another. Unconventional reservoirs being targeted like the Nibrera and the Turner. And there's always going to be a conventional oil and gas exploration going on. And you know, there's still opportunity there as well. And in the Minnelusa, I would say that's one area that's being explored. I've seen some articles in the Rocky Mountain Oil Journal about some recent discoveries and exploration work going on in sort of the northern part of the Powder River Basin. But again, you know, like we talked about earlier, you're betting that you have found a trap or a seal, drill that conventional exploration well. There's a good chance they could drill what they call a dry hole, which is basically a well that's drilled but doesn't produce uh, oil or gas. And they have to plug it. And so just kind of a little bit of a guessing game, more of a guessing game, at least, than unconventional stuff. So that's something that is going out there. And that would be probably on the highest side of the geologic risk spectrum. But again, as we're learning more and more, and one of the things that I read was really interesting. There was a study that was recently released this year by the Wyoming State Geological Survey about the horizontal Turner wells that have been drilled. And as we've mentioned, this is one of the, the biggest targets that operators are going after in the Powder River Basin. And the study's author, I have a quote here, um, geologist Rachel Toner said, it appears that the location of a horizontal well in the Wall Cree Turner, so you think about Turner formation, just remember that name, especially in regards to the reservoir depth and temperature, is a better predictor of production success than well design. What that means basically is you know, it's not so much dependent on how you drill it, it's sort of where you're drilling it. So basically, they're going after parts of the Turner formation that is typically, I would um, assume that means it's between, you know, below a certain depth where it's more thermally mature, has more productivity, you know, and this is basically looking at all the data of all of the wells that have been drilled 
in that formation, you know, horizontal well and sort of looking at location and all the geologic characteristics. And this is the conclusion they're coming to. All of that said, though, I think there's still definitely be some best practices within each formation on the drilling completion side that operators will figure out as more and more wells are drilled. I think what will happen is geologic risk will continue to go down as the engineers and geoscientists learn more about the basin and those formations. But it goes to show that right now they're just still figuring out those big high-level optimization opportunities and kind of where to drill. And we'll continue to learn more again as they drill more and more wells. So hopefully the price of oil will stay stable, allow operators to do measured exploration plans, and then hopefully move into full development and manufacturing mode as as they de-risk the basin. Hopefully this information was helpful if uh, folks are out there with minerals or looking at investing in the Powder River. Like you said, it looks like things are starting to heat up there, and uh, it's always good to check and see if you might have some minerals out there, and if so, how much, so that when they come knocking, you know about it. Yeah, that's a great point. So if you have any relatives that lived in Wyoming or Montana that might have owned mineral rights, definitely go through your records, and um, hopefully you'll be getting a phone call or a letter in the mail looking to lease your property, especially as this activity continues. Anyway, that's all we have for this episode. And as always, please stay tuned and subscribe on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts and leave us a rating and review. It only takes a minute and is definitely the best way to help us out and getting the word out about the show. And we'll give you a shout out on a future episode as well. And to ask a question to be featured on an upcoming episode, please leave a comment at mineralrightspodcast.com or you can send an email to feedback at mineralrightspodcast.com. And uh, you can always go there as well and get the show notes for this episode. Since we went through a lot of information pretty quickly, you can look at some of these statistics. We'll have links to some of these investor presentations so you can read more. So thanks again and until next time. Thanks, Justin. Thanks, Matt. Thanks so much for listening to the Mineral Rights Podcast with your host, Matt Sands. Don't forget to subscribe and share at mineralrightspodcast.com. The Mineral Rights Podcast should not be construed as investment, legal, or tax advice. All information is believed to be from reliable sources. However, we make no representation as to its completeness or accuracy.